crypto games go mainstream, but you don't just have to watch me blather on about my thoughts about it. I've got two of the leading crypto gaming experts in the entire world. You guys already know them. Let me pull them up here for you. Boom, here they are. We've got Crypto Stash and we've got Paul Barron on the show today. Very excited to have you here to go in depth on where this industry can go. Thanks for joining me, guys. Yeah, my pleasure. Great to be here. Awesome. So just to review what we're going to cover today and what's going to go down, it's going to be really, really simple. We want to talk about what is the timeline and the scope for crypto games to go mainstream. We're going to get these guys' thoughts on that. We're going to get the challenges for adoption for crypto games, all the FUD that might be out there about the environment, regulation, whatever it may be. We're going to talk about the challenges. Then I want to talk about what are the opportunities for the industry to grow. And lastly, I want to hear from Crypto Stash and Paul Barron, what their vision for the future of crypto gaming in the metaverse is. Hear it from them. These guys literally chug this stuff all day long for a living and talk about it. And lastly, we're going to open up a Q&A with all of you so that you can check so that you can ask these guys anything that's on your mind about the future of crypto gaming. And really quick, I just want to throw in a real quick shill here. Let's give them the alluvium bump. I've got it as the pinned comment on the uh, live stream itself. Subscribe to Paul Barron Network YouTube channel. He is the Sultan of Sentiment. He's got the best sentiment analysis videos in all of crypto gaming and metaverse. Really great content. Go subscribe right now. Give him the alluvium bump. And then, of course, Crypto Stash. Also, his channel is pinned in live chat and in the description. Fantastic co podcast around the metaverse. And he's got great list videos. I like his list videos that break down what's happening in crypto gaming. Real simple so that you can get a lot of information in a Go, it goes down smooth and real easy to understand in format. Gentlemen. So I like it the, smooth, baby. He likes it smooth. <laughs> that's the shill for today. Let's start out with the discussion. Let's not waste any time. How big do you think crypto games can become and in what timeline? So Crypto Stash, let's start with you. Yeah, so, you know, the timeline is the biggest factor here. Uh, do I, how big can a crypto game become in 10 years? We're not even going to call them crypto games anymore. They'll just be games. They'll, they'll, this technology will be running in the back end. It'll be so seamless and it, it people won't even think about it. We, you know, today we don't be like, oh, well, you know, I, we, we do say, well, is this game free to play? But like, we, you know, freemium, things like that, these, these become synonymous with the top games anyways. And so we don't necessarily call them games, we just call them, oh, it's a, it's a game. This is one of the aspects of it. So I think that we're going to get to that point here. Uh, is it going to be soon? I don't think so. You know, we're, we're seeing a lot of blowback uh, in traditional mainstream gaming that, uh, you know, are hurdles that we have to overcome. So do I think, I mean, crypto games, they're going to, they'll be the biggest games. They'll, they'll, they'll be the, the, the Fortnites. They'll be the uh, Valorants. They're going to be uh, the new worlds. You know, in particular, I think RPGs are really set up for them. Now, not, now the thing is, Everyone thinks that when you talk about, okay, well, NFTs are, you know, are coming to gaming and blockchain is coming to gaming. And some people think, oh, it's a scam. They're traditional gamers. And then we have crypto gamers that really get it and understand it. Like you guys watching, you guys get it and you understand it. But not everybody does. And so I think that, uh, you know, that there is a big hurdle for that. But really, it's, it's a, the technology is better. It's going to replace it eventually. We've seen that with the traditional game models evolving over time. You know, when I first started gaming, there were no free games. And this was back in the day. I mean, I started on, uh, you know, Atari doing computer games uh, early at that time as well. And there was no such thing as a free game. You had to pay for every game. And then this freemium model came about. And, you know, we, we've seen the rise of that and then mobile gaming as well. And, you know, now you see all the biggest games using this where it's free to play and they make money through skins on a store, just like you see with some of the most popular shooter games out there. Uh, but, you know, uh, when you look at the different types of games out there, you say, OK, well, crypto gaming, is it going to you know, be big? I think it will. But I, I don't think, you know, it, the NFT technology is going to work for every single game. I think it works amazing for multiplayer games. So any kind of multiplayer game where you have a skin or an asset that makes sense, I think, you know, that's totally ap applicable for this technology. Now, if you're talking about like a, a, like a story driven game where it's a single player type of, of, of you know, environment, 
I don't see NFTs really working the best in there because the whole point of them is, is being able to have ownership of these NFTs. And most of the time, you're doing that in a multiplayer environment. Not that there couldn't be some some really cool, cool use cases in a you know single player narrative type of environment, but I think they're really going to work best uh, in that multiplayer environment, which we see really dominating most of the gaming space, anyways. Uh, when you talk about casual gaming, esports gaming, we see a lot of that happening. And uh, you know, so I think the technology is going to be there, but we do have some pretty massive mainstream hurdles to overcome. Uh, we we haven't had a lot of great PR, right? I mean, in general, we haven't had seen a lot of great PR for NFTs in games. Uh, there are some people who have really, you know, pushed that forefront. I think uh, Ubisoft has done a great job, even though they get a ton of blowback, even from their own staff that don't understand this. But I can guarantee <laughs> that's exactly how it was when someone when someone came to uh, to to the company and said, "Hey guys, you know, what if we gave the way, game away for free, and just had another way of getting money?" And everyone's like, what are you crazy? That's never going to work. <laughs> right. Yeah, that totally makes sense. And this does remind me of uh, when those other gaming models came to fruition in the past. I remember when, uh, I don't know if you remember when SimCity launched about 10 years ago and it had to be online and everybody freaked out about <laughs> online games. The same thing was the case with subscription models with yeah, World of Warcraft. The same thing yeah. was the case with free to play models with League of yeah. Legends. Anytime there's a new model, there's going to be some friction there with how you're asking for people's money. Paul, what do you think about how big crypto games can become and in what timeline? Are they going to become like the number one form of gaming? Are they going to be like synonymous with gaming overall? Do you agree with Crypto Stash's perspective or do you see something else for the future scope here? Yeah, I think the uh, the growth symmetric that we'll see with crypto gaming, if you look at you know just what we've done in terms of our, our own channel, we've started to kind of isolate in on metaverse gaming, just the mechanics of where this market is going. Part of this has been because of some of the sentiment uptake that we analyze on an ongoing basis around mostly the top three to 400 games, but it really boils down to around the top 100. And when I look at that in comparison to say the traditional gaming market, uh, it, it's, it's interesting because it, right now, it's very, very small in comparison. If you look at the over, overall side, I was just looking at some of the latest data, Fortnite, 12.3 million, League of Legends, 8 million, uh, and then Crossfire and Roblox, both at, eight, at, at 4 million. And the one thing that is interesting to me is in, with those kinds of uh, kind of legacy games in the sense that they've been able to really penetrate mainstream adoption, the big question I think is going to be how quickly adoption curves are going to take. And one of the things that I think has to be leaned on here for that to occur, as much as I hate to say it, is probably going to become from a whole come from a whole new roster of gamers. And it's most likely going to come from the crypto investors that are in traditional crypto investing, maybe that are casual gamers and are not necessarily, you know, a full blown all in gamer that might be a pro level or even someone that is doing weekend warrior type stuff. So I think the ability for us to grow is going to be very critical on whether or not that sector continues to explode. And part of that gets back into the whole situ situation that we're dealing with FUD, regulation, all the scenarios that we're faced on the traditional content that we do on TechPath, which is really built around you know the crypto space itself. Because I think the adoption side of it is going to need to have two layers of adoption. One from traditional gamers that are starting to say, wait a minute, I think there's an opportunity here on play and earn. And for gamers that are have been very light in, in gaming to be able to jump in and say, this is a whole new way to look at gaming. Now it's worth my time. So I think those are the two factors that would have to come into play for this to go mainstream. I'm still a little bit concerned that this would uh, grow at an exponential rate only because of the pushback that we see from the current industry. And also the free-to-play model and kind of the, the process that of not only understanding, but also uh, being able to really kind of get your head around how NFT and digital assets work within game, gameplay. All of that, I think, plays into this in terms of the future, but uh, definitely very bullish. I just feel like we're going to see a little bit of a, um, a small curve before we see that bell curve kind of take off. Same thing happened in mobile. Same thing happened in, in internet adoption. Uh, all of the areas that, of time when I've spent my years in technology is we've seen this, you know, this uh, play before, and I don't think we're going to see 
much of a different uh, forecast here when it comes to uh, blockchain gaming. Both of you guys are immediately thinking, okay, with the scope of this, <laughs> what what are the challenges, right? So you mentioned regulation. Yeah. Folks in chat are mentioning greedy NFTs, you know, mistrust. Mm. Also, the obviously the challenges with uh, being able to onboard with wallets and what have you. So crypto stash, what do you see being the biggest headwinds for crypto gaming to become mainstream out of all of these things? Because as with any new technology, the FUD train is rolling at full speed, right? Just like we saw with the internet, uh, you know, over the last decade, we're seeing the exact same story happen now. So what do you see being the biggest headwinds? And if, and if the crypto gaming industry can overcome these, then that's the barrier that we break through and really accelerate. What do you think that is? Uh, yeah, I mean, I would say that, you know, actually, before I jump into that, I just want to address one little point that Paul made, you know, he was saying that, uh, that I think that he thinks that really the adoption is going to be coming from within the crypto industry. And that's really what's going to, to, to catapult this forward. And I actually I disagree with that. I think that, you know, mainstream gaming is really what is going to benefit the most from it. it's not going to be the, the, the people who are crypto investment heavy that are looking for that like earning opportunity. I really think that the big opportunity is uh, for gamers to understand that it's not necessarily, the play to earn side is great, but it's really the asset ownership side over the money that you're investing into a game that is really the big win here for everybody and for gamers in general. Uh, and I, I do, I strongly think that that is really where things are gonna come from. That's why I really support, you know, mainstream companies like Ubisoft are doing things like that, where they're, you know, sprinkling that in to their mainstream audience. And they'll get it eventually because if you are if you're a true gamer and you've spent money inside of a game on skins and then decided to move to a different game, what do you do with what, what happens to that money? All that money's now locked in there. I've spent thousands of dollars on skins and games and then ended up, you know, a year or two later playing a different game. I'm like, well, what about the five thousand dollars I just put in that game? You never get that back. And NFTs at least help you to unlock some of that liquidity that you have in that game. So you're not uh, you know, stuck with just you know, a bunch of money stuck in something. So, uh, but but that kind of piggybacks here onto that next point when you talk about, well, wh what is the biggest headwind here? What What is the biggest, you know, roadblock to mainstream adoption of this technology in mainstream gaming? And I think that it really comes down to education. You know, I think that so many people are very quick to dismiss something that is brand new because they, they just don't really want to spend the time educating themselves. And we see that time and time again, every time that, uh, you know, we see a mainstream, you know, gaming audience get exposure to NFTs or blockchain, they quickly, I think, dismiss it because they're getting a surface level exposure to what's going on. So they just see like, oh, well, you know, there's scams and oh, these board apes just for millionaires. And, 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 you know, they're just trying to take our money. And I'm like, they're already doing it. And you just don't even care. You know, people are already spending millions, billions of dollars almost on skins per year. The skins market is massive and it is only getting bigger. Every single game, major game that's coming out has this built in. So, you know, when, when I when I get down to that, you know, you, you look at, well, what, what's the uh, what's the drop off rate for a game in general? If you look at the adoption curve for games, it's very high at the beginning when they launch. And then it, and you can see this and then it plateaus eventually and you get that user base, right? Like I started playing uh, New World when it first came out last year. Great game, played it for like three months and haven't played it in the last four months. You know what I'm saying? And this is that's like a very big thing in gaming. The attention span for a particular game doesn't last very long. So if you you know put a bunch of money into skins or into in-game currency for this game because you really loved it and you were super hardcore with it for three or four months, and then you move on to the next game. But then what do you do with all that money anymore? It's all locked in there. People are saying in chat like, oh, well, you know, what's the difference between that and a, and a Web 2 store? Or I could trade my skin with somebody else in the game. I know. But if you paid $100 for that skin, you're not getting that. You're not getting USD value back out of that. You know, there's no way for you to exchange your V-Bucks for back into USD. And so that's some of the, the, the power that we see with crypto. And I think that that big hurdle for us getting there is really just the knowledge that these things are, you know, this technology can replace what we already have in a way that doesn't make it scammy, doesn't make it a cash grab, and actually benefits both the the player and the developer. And that's, I think, where a lot of people lose that as well. It's 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 a win-win for both sides, 100%. Dude, preach it, brother, okay? I love everything you're saying about the mainstreamification wow. of gaming. I, I think that all of the ideas you're saying are right, and you have the moral high ground and all of that here. 
But I have to point out, with Ubisoft's NFT drops recently and what have you, the response that I saw online, and I want to kick this over to Paul because Paul's the sentiment mm -hmm. analysis guy and he sees the data on what people actually think about these things. Most of the chatter I saw around those NFT drops was, oh, here's another way to monetize us because you've been nickel and diming us on DLC and microtransactions for a long time. And while yeah. I agree with you, it is beneficial to gamers for them to be able to actually own assets in the game and retain some financial value, has the mainstream gaming industry destroyed their trust with their customers so that when they try to bring in these new models, that is going to be seen as yet another way to nickel and dime them. What are your thoughts on that, Paul? Yeah, I think what, what you look at um, in this kind of scenario before you've seen it happen in different kinds of industries, especially when you look at just the size and scope of some of these companies. And it is concern, but back to Stash's point, is that when I'm talking about the adoption, it's gonna take a multi-tiered adoption for us to be able to really see growth. Obviously, we'll see adoption coming in from you know the bleeding edge and leading edge of uh, traditional gamers that will jump into blockchain. They will, they'll, they'll start to come over. At the same time, you're still going to need, you know, the crypto investors that understand what a digital asset is, understands what what NFTs are, and they're game curious. And that's where your probably your biggest opportunity is. I know there's three billion gamers worldwide. If you look at some of the the metrics out there, but overall, I think to answer your question, Andrew, is that when you look back into just the historic nature of how Microsoft built what they're doing with Xbox, uh, what we've seen with the Sony and and the PlayStation. The evolution of those games, again, will be very, I'm, I'm still a little bit skeptical as to whether or not major uh, studios will come over full-fledged into, in obviously into blockchain. I don't think they will, but I do believe there will be some testing of the waters and it still may take some time. It's really gonna be upon the smaller studios and the blockchain studios that really kind of crack the code on this. But you're right, the, the big challenge that we are going to face is going to be, I think, twofold. One, of course, is the adoption rate uh, from mainstream uh, that's going to come over from the, you know, just the, the tech array that it takes to build a blockchain game of, of equal quality to what we're seeing to a certain extent in uh, AAA. Uh, but the other aspect is, and this is the one I'm most concerned about when in gaming, in blockchain gaming, and that is... Uh, I mean, we're looking at, I would say, anywhere between 50 and 100 new games per month coming into the ecosystem of blockchain gaming. And the one thing that uh, I see more and more is uh, a lot of market manipulation from these gaming companies and the developers themselves. And everybody's trying to get a foothold. I get that and I understand that. Sometimes it's hard to sort out the chaff from the market. And I think that's going to become the art for both investors and also the gamers to understand where the scams are, where the ulterior motives are in some of these gaming companies. And just if you look at some of the sentiment data that we see on these games, they rise and fall so quickly. And for the kind of strategies that many of these houses are gonna to have to take, these are long-term roadmap strategies. So they've gotta be able to have a plan in place that's going to one, kind of whitewash to a certain extent the industry so we can get some trust in it because this is exactly what happened in the early days of the internet it was looked at as where all the criminals were i'm not going to go in and put you know you know uh get into any kind of an investment because these guys are going to do a rug pull those kind of things if you just take that back about 25 years and look at the uh evolution now just transplant that in today's society for blockchain gaming and i think we're facing the same challenge and that's only going to drive regulatory issues. It's going to drive, uh, you know, critical mask adoption scenarios that will probably become a little bit uh, more difficult to over overcome. And then I also think it's going to change the direction of the developers that start to go in the place or in the space, which is very concerning because the developer architecture of coming over from and building in blockchain versus building in AAA or, or traditional games is going to be very interesting over the next three or four years we are really going to see either a huge you know uh developer crop building in blockchain games or we're going to see a very isolated uh more centralized group of maybe a top 50 uh, group of projects out there and that's the concern i have because that of course will affect adoption in a big way that makes sense guys i love that you disagree this is great
I was hoping that, that we <laughs> wouldn't all agree with each other the whole time. It makes for a better discussion. So there's a lot yep. of headwinds to overcome here and a lot of unknowns. And I think that you guys did a great job of covering those. But let's talk about the opportunities. And Stash started touching on those a moment ago. The idea that you can actually own value in these games and not, uh, you know, spend $1,000 in some mobile game and get nothing at the end of the day in your pocket. Let's talk about what can the crypto games industry do better than the legacy games industry to accelerate adoption here? What are the things that maybe we can fix this time around to innovate and to make this space better? Like, for example, with Alluvium, we're trying to make a, you know, a real AAA game here. That's not just some mini game or not just some, you know, double A or single A game. We want to make a real AAA game. That is something that uh, is comparable or if not better than anything you can play in the legacy gaming space. But then there's these crypto elements on top. So what do you guys think the crypto gaming industry can do to just maybe get rid of some of those terrible things from legacy gaming or to improve upon some items in legacy gaming to finally do away with that and then move forward so that gamers can get a better product and a better experience? Stash, what do you think about that, man? So, um, you know, talking about, you know, what, what is the good uh, opportunities for, you know, aid the developers and, and also be the players? Because that's the two sides right there, right? You have both sides of the coin. It, we, we, a system needs to work better for both. It can't just be beneficial just for the developer side, right? Like, oh, because of this, we're going to make more money, right? So we're going we're gonna to go this route. It needs to be good for both sides. The players also have to benefit as well. And, you know, kind of talking and touching about, uh, you know, the the sentiment with Ubisoft, the Ubisoft drop for NFTs, that was actually a free drop. So there was no extra money there. It wasn't like, oh, you had to pay for it. So that was something they did that was just a, a quick, you know, hey, let, let's let's see how this goes with the mainstream audience. And we're going to do this for free. Anybody can earn it just for free in the game. And I, I think that, you know, when you talk about the trust that gamers have with with gaming companies i mean we see that violated all the time i mean you you can go in like ea activision blizzard like time and time again you know th there's been issues with you know game launches game communities it's not something that uh you know is is infrequent it happens now like i said the the, the biggest opportunities i think here for blockchain technology to be incorporated in nfts i look at it more just uh, uh, the incorporation of these elements is similar to the incorporation of using a game engine like Unity or Unreal. There was a time when people were making games, guys, where they didn't have these things, you know? There weren't these frameworks that they could just pick up and start using. And so I see that as just another element or another plugin that you'd be using. Like, you know, you have a, 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 a physics plugin that you use for these things. They'll just be a blockchain and an NFT plugin, and it's that simple. Uh, but the real opportunity here, I think, uh, on, the, on the player side is A, uh, you, you understand and know the rarity of that asset and how many are out there. And that is a true, genuine asset you own. I don't know about you guys. If you are actually gamers out there, if you're only NFT crypto enthusiasts, I play video games. I play a lot of them. I'm actually playing the games. I get it. Have you ever, uh, you know, accidentally bought a weapon or a skin that was actually a fake duped skin that someone found an exploit in the game and they went and duped that, that that thing and they're selling it on the marketplaces. The marketplaces, by the by the way, that are actually not sanctioned by the game, which could get you banned for being in and using, which is another element we'll talk about here in a second. But that's one of the first things is understanding this is a true, genuine item. There's no way to do that right now. You know, so duped items get on marketplaces in particular for MMOs and RPGs. They, they, it's it's wild rampant. gold is rampant and yes, uh, yeah, i mean the right. world of warcraft is a classic example of a secondary yes. market and then billionaires literally investing into businesses to dupe people on those secondary markets so exactly. this is a real yeah. problem absolutely yeah, no, it, it's a huge problem so if you're a gamer you know uh so i think that's one of the biggest benefits is that the, it, nfts can help do that you can verify that this is a true this is, this is a true item i can trace it back here's the data that that proves that and here's the data that also proves that there's only a thousand of these out there. That's rare. That now that uh, you know lends to the fact that it can have a true value placed upon it, a, a monetary value, right? And so then you look at uh, you know some of these other things. Well, you know right now what we've been doing with these game loops is you know no you can't trade outside the game. If you do that, you do anything to trade that you're, you're going to be tossed. And so you know th this kind of goes and says well well if people are already doing this and they've been doing it for years. And trying to get away with it and people make like incorporate it into the game loop and monetize it so that you talk about what's the best uh, opportunity for the developers is that they can be part of that monetization loop right so right now as a as a game developer i spend you know i have one of my team members spend we'll say 
you know, 20 hours on, on a, a brand new skin we're going to put in our store, right? Uh, you put that skin in the store and you say, hey, we're going to do it for a limited time or we're only going to sell, you know, X amount of copies. It's not going to be on there forever. You've made, you know, 10 bucks per skin. You've sold them out. You've made X amount of money, right? You've made, we'll say, uh, you know, $50,000 from the skin drop. That's where the money stops. You get no more money after this. But if that skin was an NFT that your uh, you know, fan base could then trade in a secondary marketplace, you could be getting a smaller royalty off of each one of those trades. So you make the initial sale and now you're getting a royalty, right? And that royalty is coming from the, the, the buyer side of things, not from the seller. So the seller is getting you know, what, what they want to get from there. And there might be some seller fees based on the marketplace, but the, the original creator is also getting some of that money too. So you talk about independent developers that are doing games like this, that could be a huge boost to revenue for them. Uh, and so th I think that those are two of the biggest, you know, opportunities that we have on that side. Not, 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 I mean, we can go into the other things about, like I said, I talked about earlier about NFTs, you know, being assets that you can buy and sell, you can get your value back out of them. Uh, I think that's great as well. And the play to earn element is pretty cool too. That's something that we, you know, that is still, I think, uh, um, a harder road to go down and like tackle to really get something solid as far as, you know, workable economy that's not going to just be farmed to death or not going to be botted, which is obviously a problem in every game right now. Bots, 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 but it's a huge problem in crypto gaming. So I really do think those are two of the biggest top tier opportunities for this technology and how it's going to drive this space forward. That's great. And yeah, you're right about play to earn games. I've, I've been uh, studying some. Um, it's exciting as a gamer, maybe, and also as if I was a young person with no money, uh, which I had no money when I was young, I would be excited to be able to play a video game and earn in the video game. But what I've seen from play to earn games that have, let's say a 20, 30, 40, 50 percent uh, with their tokenomics in game yield as a part of their model their token price just falls off the face of the earth once the game launches, yeah. no matter how good the game is. And so yeah. that Alluvium has not designed tokenomics like that. And I'm glad because that build that's got built in inflation into uh, the token price and it applies constant downward pressure essentially on the token price, which can maybe kill the economy altogether. So play to earn I think having a small portion of the total token pool or value that can be allocated to get new players interested and to get them in the door and give them a little bit of uh, energy, if you will, to get started can make sense. But these high 20, 30, 40, 50% yield tokenomics models, I've seen a 100% failure rate so far on those. So play to earn mm -hmm. is still kind of definitely something um, that we need to figure out as an industry. That's for sure. Paul, what do you see being the biggest opportunities for the crypto gaming industry to do better than legacy gaming? What things do you want to kill with fire and never see again that maybe <laughs> crypto gaming can fix once and for all? What do yeah, you think, or, man? Right, right. So I have a whole line list of these things that uh, we've kind of put together. One is ease of onboarding, I think, is going to be a big factor if we can look at, at ways to make it easier for not only you know traditional gamers who are, are somewhat tech savvy already, but just be able to get the crypto or crypto curious and also game curious, especially as we get into the play to earn model, because I think it'll attract, you know, a, a slew of new types of gamers uh, other than the traditional gamer. And then I think game studios hijacking the the term NFTs, that's going to be a, a big issue. Stash kind of mentioned that whole point. Uh, play to win is probably going to be a big factor, I think, in, in terms of growth, because it is going to open up a whole new metric around how games will be built, uh, economies will be created. And the economists themselves that are building the games themselves will, of course, get a chance to really kind of shine on that. And then the other factor that I think is going to be interesting, and I'm just wondering if we'll see any regulation on this, is distancing themselves from crypto gambling and lotteries. So that is, as we see more and more of this kind of thing, this outside of, you know, traditional uh, tournament style games this is a new element that is really different in in for most gamers this is a whole new way of thinking about how gaming is going to happen uh ending scholarships will probably have to uh happen you know for that to really you know continue to see more growth there uh partnering with more trusted brands i think will be a big factor just you know just because you're going to need faith and getting into uh especially if you're getting into the masses uh to really kind of come into the space uh, the other ca category that I'm always worried about and what we look at when we cover games is how well is the, de the team doxxed? How much do you know about the team behind it? Now, I know in traditional gaming, you probably don't know as much, but it's different now because you're dealing with money. 
you're dealing with an investment, whether it's a digital asset or actually a token that's supported by the game, all those kind of things can really play into it. Uh, but yeah, there's a lot more around it. I think the other big factor that the gaming industry really suffers from right now, blockchain gaming, is the knockoff games themselves uh, and how that might be looked at and viewed uh, upon by the, the new gamers and also the traditional gamers coming into the space. So lots of opportunities right there. All those kinds of things we could fix fairly easily with the right kind of leadership and team members that are leading out these these game companies because uh, they have that choice. They have the choice to really kind of address a lot of these things that really I think just makes it for a, a golden highway you know, to success for sure. Okay, I think that those are, I think you make some great <laughs> points. One thing that, uh, you know, as far as opportunities are concerned and challenges, I think the biggest thing for, that I'm seeing with my friends in my personal network is the onboarding with crypto wallets and yeah, the yeah. getting your money in there to be able to make purchases. And for me, that's the biggest <laughs> opportunity is once there is a solve for, you know, your friend who has never bought crypto yeah. before, but can just use their credit card or connect their whatever account, cash app, Venmo or whatever, and then enter that mm -hmm. space. Once that solve occurs, I think that, uh, you're going to be able to really unlock the masses to come into this space. But as it stands right now, having two, three, four steps sometimes to onboard into a game can be really challenging. Uh, so hopefully we can get a solve on that soon. And there's a bunch of different projects and companies that are working on that moon pay and the like, uh, working yeah. on that solve. Um, yeah. So let's talk about what is your perfect world look like? What is the, like, both of you guys are in this space, right? Because you love it, obviously. Like you, you just chug this stuff all day long and talk about it all day long. The second I emailed you to be on the show, you're both like, yes, I'm in. I want to talk about this on Movie <laughs> Insider. So you have to have some sort of interesting vision in your mind that really inspires you about where this space is going. So Stash, I want to start with you. In your perfect world, in your like 10 out of 10 perfect scenario, what does the crypto game space look like let's say toward the end of the decade, once it has matured more, paint that picture for us of what you're seeing in your mind. Yeah, so, you know, I, I, I wanna say it's like this this perfect utopia of, of gaming and everything works perfect. I don't know that that's actually realistic. You know, I think that there are still gonna be some downsides. There always is, no matter how good of a system you have, there's always somebody out there that's going to uh, wanna rain and shit on your parade. It just happens. Uh, and, you know, gaming is no exception to that. Uh, what what I would see ideally is, you know, a fully immersive metaverse with, you know, full interoperability between everything. So when you talk about like this ideal of, you know, perfect kind of, you know, conception of this, I think Ready Player One as a book and movie actually does a really good job. I think that Steven Spielberg did a good job of like visually displaying what that is in his movie. Uh, and the book is obviously amazing as well. Uh, but yeah, having a seamless, you know, experience where, you know, games are connected in a way that uh, it, it, they're not siloed. And that's how that's the experience we have right now. You know, we have these very siloed yeah. experiences and, you know, assets don't transfer your avatars and stats and other things like that. Don't kind of, you know, go from game to game. You're always starting over as a noob in a new game. And that can be fun, too. But I, I think that, uh, you know, that that is really what I want to see is this this kind of, you know, super connected metaverse where all games are are seamless, your character, your stats, things like that, your your weapons are are NFTs that you take with you. Your character is 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 a is a non fungible, unique token that can go from place to place. And you know, having that that kind of interoperability is what, what we're starting on right now. That's what blockchain and NFTs actually provide. And I think a lot of people don't really understand and realize that. And that's one of those other big opportunities for NFTs in general is the fact that you know. You can, you could take them from game to game. You know, a developer, a developer could say, "Hey, here's a database of NFTs that can be interoperable." And in this game, it's a really sweet, you know, battle axe. In this other game, it's an axe attachment to my, you know, uh, uh, my spaceship speeder that does something different. And you know, but so they have this different use case in different games. They don't look exactly the same, maybe, but that you can take that asset from game to game, and that is super powerful. I'm thinking about being able to take your Fortnite skins over into League of Legends or vice versa. You know, uh, that kind of interoperability, I think, is going to come in an ideal world. I think that's what we want to see, you know, uh, tokenized economies 
that uh, make total sense that are not like just big extractors, right? Uh, that you know uh, really allow people to play and earn if they want to, and maybe earn a living doing it, but not in a way where it's you know just completely dominated by bots. So I think having that kind of balance is not an easy thing to achieve, but in the idea world, that's what I would see. That's what I would be looking for, and that is you know kind of what uh, I think that we'll eventually get to is we'll get to this point where, you know, things are so well interconnected. We're already seeing it, you know, in, in, a, in a global perspective, right? The world is more connected and interweaved than it ever has been before. And the internet allowed us to do that. And so I think that, you know, gaming is kind of going to come and take it to that next step and that next level where, you know, we have this virtual environment that does that and represents a lot of things that we're doing in, you know, uh, in, in real life, but can take it to a virtual level, which unlocks a lot more, uh, you know, across the globe. I mean, you know, as, as as weird and dumb as this might sound, you know, Facebook, when they came out with this big switch to, to being called meta, everyone was kind of like, oh, this is a bad move, bad take. And, you know, when they first really kind of talked about it, I was like, yeah, I, I don't really trust Facebook. I'm not a big Facebook fan at all. But when I heard them talk about how the first thing they were going to do is kind of work on some of the tools you need for this, having a universal translator that does it in real time, is going to be massively bullish for the gaming industry and for this particular idea where we're seeing the metaverse propagate to being fully fluid across all languages, all time zones, and being interoperable. That's a big element there. So I think that we're building those tools and we'll get there where, where we do have that. And we have a full virtual environment where you know these things work. Uh, they work in the background. There is no barrier to entry. You know, you talked about earlier about like, oh, well, right now, one of the big things is that, you know, crypto wallets are hard to use and not everybody understands them and you can't get your money in quick enough or easy enough. And that's very true. You know, I'm not saying here that's not, but that doesn't mean that there aren't games that have solved that already. If you look at Splinterlands, one of the oldest and OG games out there in play to earn, they have had one of the best systems forever and they've just flown underneath the radar where Axie Infinity is, you know, pumping what Splinterlands has been doing for the space has been far greater. And you can buy their token, their stuff with PayPal. You can literally buy it with the game with PayPal. Like how much simpler does it get than that? So uh, it's definitely coming and we're, we're getting there. We're working towards that. But yeah, that, that would be kind of my, my idea of Utopia is this, this kind of, you know, connected metaverse where, uh, you know, you, you, you have your items, they're non-fungible tokens. Your character can be changed, swapped out. It can be used across all these games, also non-fungible. Uh, and, uh, you, you know, we, we have a better, funner metaverse. I love that vision, and it certainly is. Uh, a lot of people saw the Meta announcement as a negative thing, like Zuckerberg is going to dip his hands into your crypto wallet or control, I mean, yeah. have have like a cringy version of the metaverse. <laughs> well, I tell you what, <laughs> that is. Here's this is not this is uh this is the part that I took away from that, and I thought it was a positive. He has nineteen thousand employees working at Oculus right now mm -hmm. on to to break through on hardware and to yeah. break through in virtual reality. Uh, that's not yeah. nothing. And so whether yeah. you trust Facebook or not, or you trust Meta or not, or you trust Zuckerberg or not, the hardware breakthroughs that are going to come out of mm -hmm. Oculus are very exciting for this space yeah. to move us toward that Ready Player One vision that you're talking about. And the last note I want to have here, and Paul, I want to know your vision. What The thing that screams to me when you talk about this Ready Player One scenario, in Ready Player One, that metaverse is a centralized entity and the story of Ready Player Two in particular is about all of the problems that happen because it's run by a centralized entity. And I don't want to spoil Ready Player Two if you haven't read it. These are some really, really terrible problems, literally life and death, versus interoperability and then having all these metaverses be able to connect with each other in a decentralized way. Mm -hmm. Which way is it going to shake out? I don't know. But personally, I don't want the centralized route because I've read Ready Player Two, <laughs> and it, that does seem like a potential scenario where um, if everybody's on one network and everybody's relying on one metaverse, the risks right. involved could be massive. Paul, what yeah. is your vision for the metaverse 10 years from now? Is it Ready Player yeah. One, or is it something a little bit different than what Stash was talking about? Well, I think to your point, uh, Andrew, is that the evolution of what will happen in the metaverse, I, th I feel like it, at least right now, is the decentralized model. Is, I, I think that has to win out. If it doesn't, and we have companies like Meta, I mean, and you kind of lean in on it. You talked about the number of employees that are really focused in on the VRAR component at Oculus, but look at the number of adoption. I mean, they're almost at 3 billion users 
globally. That's mass, that's mainstream. That's obviously mass adoption, half the planet essentially. And having access to that really starts to worry me a little bit in the sense that we could see a fast uptake on this with the fact that, you know, Facebook, obviously with the amount of their social graph and how they understand data and what they're looking to do, if they don't recreate, and I don't want to make this a meta topic, but if they don't recreate kind of the the mess that they've caused with Facebook, I think from a both a social standpoint, political standpoint, I mean, you could go on forever. Because I think this opportunity is going to be very critical right now. The, hand, the question is going to be a handful of companies, whether it's a Microsoft or it's someone else, maybe an Apple that tries to break, break free in a decentralized model, or is it going to be kind of the evolution of the companies that are already trying to move in this space, whether it's a Sandbox or a Blocktopia or all these types of companies that are really trying to move into the decentralized you know, model. And I think the other thing that, that when you look at the utopia of what the metaverse could bring is obviously we've got to get past the NFT stigma where gamers don't hate that. Right, well, found how NFTs can be identified. Oh, Paul, we Hello? lost you there for a minute, buddy. There we go. Hold on. Okay. Paul's back. We're back. I think I think Zuckerberg. I think Zuckerberg. Zuckerberg. I clearly he heard us, man. He's Paul like he's there. Hey, let's yep. jump the stream yeah, down, guys. That is. Shut yeah, it. Uh, yeah, somehow he, he, bro he busted into he's Google probably the number one <laughs> investor in this uh, streaming yeah. technology we're using. Uh, anyway, my point is is that that with NFTs you've got. A couple of things we got to overcome some hurdles there. One from the gaming, uh, you know, side of things where there's a lot more acceptance, but also just identifying, you know, the types of NFTs and how they can be used in the future. And I think that's going to be a big factor. The other area that I think is utopian is the idea of uh, getting away from free to play and into the model of game subscriptions because that's worked well with Xbox. I think we'll continue to see this now with Netflix getting into gaming. This could be a big deal because it could really create that on-ramp that we've been looking for in a way that could be very unique and different and the ability to really do game exploration. So I think that'll be really interesting in the future. You kind of mentioned on the AR VR side. I think that's a hands down part of it. I'm, I'm leaning more towards the AR side and not as much in VR, even though I think VR will make it. It's just probably a little bit further down. And then probably last but not least is the adoption curve away from the traditional gamer uh, demographic. And that is going back toward more women and children into gaming. And I think younger kids really moving into gaming and seeing that perfect utopia of what this might look like, both from an education standpoint, the ability for social skills. I mean, there's so much there that can be uh, really advanced forward in the form of blockchain technology in the box or package of a great blockchain game. So I think there's a lot of opportunity here for, for where the future is going to be. It's really, I, I love what you said about women and children being integrated because you think of gamers, especially the crypto gaming space, is, it's a bro fest, right? Like look at the yeah, avatars yeah. and we, we know who's in here crypto right now. It's mostly men. For sure. It's a, such a bro <laughs> yeah, fest. Unfortunately. So with women and children, yeah. are you think the, the, the integration there, are you thinking that more along the lines of uh, education, of like productivity, of lifestyle, and these other yeah. sort of more, well, uh, let's say everyday a, things that have a material version today, and then we get those dematerialized and then digitized in the metaverse. Is that is that what you mean the, by the aspect? Well, okay. So you look at this, Andrew. I've got two. I've got two kids under the age of seven, and both of them, you know, they're very close in, and they're starting to explore games. They're starting to understand uh, the monetary ecosystems of games. And they're starting to ask a lot of questions about those. But within those games, there's, to a certain extent, some social skills. There's a lot of learning and life skills that you can learn within a game. And being able to roster up the Gen Z crowd right now, which is really under the age of 20, the opportunity is huge because you think Gen Y was a big demographic. Let's just forget about you know Gen X like me, we're aging out, but you've got Gen Y, which is the millennial crowd, which is really starting to age out you know, with 36, 37, and the kind of game they're gonna be interested in versus what we're gonna see in terms of the younger audience, which to me is really the natural evolution of gaming. It's the fun part of a game. And when you have that exploration and that, uh, it's like Disney. I mean, you're going in there for that awe, that cool factor. It's like whether you're exploring Star Wars. I mean, I still do that today. 
I love that kind, and I'm, I'm a big movie buff. You know, those entertainment elements are going to be huge. Women and children are going to lead, I think, a lot of that, that marketplace. And whoever wins that, I mean, if you look at Roblox and kind of what they've been able to do very quickly, but there's a lot of opportunities. Education, blockchain, uh, education, I think, will be a big factor of this into the gaming you know, future of a utopian kind of perfect process because all of this graduates people into the next level and then into the next level. And I think that's uh, very critical for the growth of, of how all this is going to go. That makes sense. I want to make sure we fulfill our promise of Q&A with you guys. Everybody has a lot of questions they want to ask the two of you since you're experts on this. Let me pull up a question here. We have about 10 minutes, and then these guys probably have yet another podcast or show they need to go to. So here's one from <laughs> Kevin Rowe. And either of you can take this. Just uh, let me know who wants to take it. But why is blockchain NFT assets better for in a game than, than like a normal Web2 marketplace like you'd get in a mobile game where you get diamonds or whatever for cash? What, why would a blockchain NFT asset be superior? Um, either one of you guys can take this question. Stash, you can take that layup. All right. So, <laughs> I mean, I, I kind of tossed, I, I already kind of touched on this before, you know. Uh, I think that, you know, it, the big advantages we have over it is, you know, understanding that, you know, this is an asset that you could then go and re trade. So most Web2 marketplaces are a one-way street. You go into the, the Epic Game Store, you buy the skin, that's it. There's nothing else after that, you know, a Web3 marketplace, you go to the, the Web3 marketplace, you buy the skin, you can go then trade it back and forth on this the, this marketplace. Maybe it goes up in value. Maybe it's super rare. Maybe you've earned it in right. game and you can trade it there. So I think that's that's the one of the biggest, you know, things that make it better, a Web3 store over, over a Web2 store. Makes sense. You can retain value and you actually own it and uh, have uh, have your own yeah. asset. Um, here's an interesting yeah, if, one. If you think it. If you Go think ahead. about that, Andrew, let me jump in. Uh, also, the creator sphere that's going to be co coming into the space. Remember, NFT assignable creativity uh, rights within the NFT. So, if you are a creator and you're starting to develop within a, a truly, you know, decentralized model for this, the opportunity for those creators to be able to get, you know, a certain amount of royalty, so to speak, on that NFT is going to be critical because then at that point you're drawing in more creators who are creating even better game assets and better game experiences within mm -hmm. an NFT box, it's going to open up, I think, a massive uh, influx of innovation in gaming in the future. That makes sense. Well, we, we mentioned earlier how our best friend and most trusted CEO, uh, Mark Zuckerberg, is investing into uh, <laughs> Oculus with 19,000 employees. So here's a question from Super Lemonade. How far away does everybody think good quality VR is for the average person to spend an hour or two after work in virtual reality? And I'll add to that, maybe an hour or two in work in virtual reality. Uh, I love, yeah. personally, I love the idea of the uh, the virtual desk. Like you guys see my control room here or whatever that I have here. Personally, I would love to dematerialize this. I don't know a better word, but the idea is not have to have all this physical gear here to do all the things and be efficient in my daily work. I would prefer to have a virtual version of this that I could customize yeah. myself that's much cheaper and is just a piece of software, right, where I could do my job every day. Where, How far out do you guys think we are from having something that's easy to use, doesn't hurt your brain when you put it on? I've tested all these VR headsets for like the last decade and at, at conferences and what have you, and we have made some progression, right, where you don't have a giant plug in the back of your head all the time necessarily. We've got battery technology. The screens are getting better but are we still in the caveman days here, guys, with VR? Are we way out? Or do you think we're right around the corner from having real mainstream VR um, hardware? Love to know if uh, yeah. either of you guys can take this. So I'll, I, I'll I go first on. Oh, go for it. Go okay, for go it. ahead. Go ahead, Paul. Paul first. Hit Paul it. first. Okay, yeah, go, All Paul. Right. You got this. Okay. Okay, I'm just saying that, you know, with if you listen to uh, Lex uh, Friedman's podcast and with with Mark Zuckerberg and really take a look at at what Lex and he were talking about one thing that that uh, Zuckerberg talks about is that and he kept you know feigning into this quite a bit is that they're a lot closer than a lot of people think so it's very possible that we could see some pretty amazing innovation and i think they're in a race probably with uh, companies like Microsoft and obviously Apple would probably be uh, in the wings but i think actually Meta may be closer to this than a lot of people think of being able to get a true, uh, real VR uh, environment. And he did talk a lot about 
uh, productivity, which I think will be a big part of that, just like what you mentioned, Andrew. Got it. That makes sense. Um, all right. We have even more. The very thoughtful questions I want to think. Look, Zuckerberg just attacked Stash as well. Did you guys see that? So Blix, yeah. <laughs> uh, really quick, what are your thoughts on the VR side of things, Stash? Uh, I was just going to say, when we look at the scope of where I feel we're at, uh, if you look at, uh, you know, gaming consoles and really where gaming started, we'll say kind of Atari level to where we are now, right, with the current consoles, I'd say we're at, uh, mm -hmm. I'd say we're at like Super Nintendo level with VR headsets. And so I think there's a lot, a, a, a long ways to go uh, before we get there. And, uh, and, and so, but, but yeah, I'm, I'm excited about it. And I think AR plays a, a part in that too. And I think that we'll see kind of both those being applicated uh, or both, both those applications used for kind of different things, you know? Um, so I, I do think we're kind of in that range. Got it. Here's one that's near and dear to my heart. And, uh, and Blickster, the, the Blickter, I believe, Blickter. Thank you for this one. Interested to hear thoughts on how predatory monetization fits into blockchain gaming, such as loot boxes and these sort of borderline gaming, gambling mechanics. I mean, Great look, question. NBA 2K, which is rated E for everyone, for example, literally has like a roulette wheel in it for you to earn NBA stuff. When I saw that, I, I as you know, as a gamer and I follow the industry closely, I was thinking, I really don't want my you know, six-year-old daughter playing a game that has a roulette wheel in it. And mm -hmm. so there's been this sort of gray area, let's call it, in the gaming industry with Web 2 games, legacy games. So do we want those things to be gone forever in crypto gaming? Do you think they will come over into crypto gaming? What are your thoughts on those predatory elements? And do you think if they do come over, NFT loot boxes, and you know, you never know which NFT you're going to get out, et cetera, is that going to reduce the credibility of crypto gaming by bringing some of maybe the worst elements of legacy gaming in? I'm going to give it to Stash first on this one so we don't argue over who's next. Stash, what are your thoughts on bringing over these more, let's call them scummier business practices? They're already here, man. <laughs> I don't know if you guys know. I mean, I, like I said, I, I, I'm, I'm looking at gaming and NFTs across almost every major blockchain that does anything having to do with gaming. They're already here. We're already seeing tons of projects use loot boxes, uh, essentially a random chance at getting something. And it makes total sense. I mean, th this is a tradition that goes back before games, really, even before uh, like, yeah. like, you know, video games. Uh, anyone collect baseball cards as a kid? I did. Yeah. And uh, yeah. you get that you get that that that, that pack of cards. You don't know the what's in that pack. Card. It's a it's a random chance. I don't know what's going to be in there, man. Is there, we know there's going to be base like tops baseball cards in there. That's all you know. This is the exact same thing. Now, do I think that it, it was it's, it's considered gambling? I mean, yeah, there is a gambling element into it. I mean, there definitely is. And, you know, this is a, a, a problem we're, we're seeing more and more with this happening more and more in, in games. I am 100% sure that regulation is going to come for this at some point. Um, yeah. I, I don't see it, you know, I don't see it as uh, close to and akin to what we would see in like a Vegas style gambling, like you're sitting down at a, at a blackjack table or poker. I but but it does have a gambling element into it. Now you could look at some other trends where we we saw like like actual skin gambling where people are using skins to like bet on matches and things like that. I mean, I think that's where it gets more to like the the sports betting right and sports booking side of things. I think loot boxes are very borderline right there. I if if it was given to me, I would say I wouldn't consider them fully gambling, but they definitely have gambling elements there. Uh, and I do think that uh, it is something that uh, is going to come. Uh, do, uh, you know, is it predatory? I think that, you know, it, it's a mod it's, it's a model that we've been using for a long time. And I think as long as it's done in a, you know, transparent way, which blockchain enables and helps with, then I, I, I don't think it's going to be super detrimental to the industry as a whole. I think you nailed it there. If you're transparent about the way the mechanics work in your game and you communicate those effectively and everybody knows that ahead of time that that's the way it works, then it's far less predatory. Yeah. But if you masquerade as it being something that it's not and then get people into a predatory model, that's where it becomes the scumbag model, if you will, that I was referring to a moment ago. So I think that that requires ethics on the behalf of developers to make sure that all of that information is upfront and that everybody understands what they're getting into. Not to mention, you got to make sure the game's fun, right? Yeah, and so if well. it's too aggressive in terms of the rewards, then it's not fun and the game will fail. Paul, I'd love to get your thoughts on this, and then we're going to have to wrap up this episode. 
I think I think Stash hit it. You know, the the element is already here. It's most likely going to be affected by regulation at some point. But also, I think the the big factor that will start to flow into this is the games that are doing that. In many cases, they might doing that might be doing that just to try to draw in that um, additional interest in a game, especially when you bring money into the the equation. It may not necessarily be as fun to play, so they're you know they try to throw in the extra little nuances into the game to help draw that in. But I think the games that you know just have great economies, really great design, may not necessarily have to go in that direction. So hopefully we won't see this happen so much. But if anytime you're dealing with money, which is what we're dealing with now, which is a completely different element that we'll draw into it, we're going to draw all the bad seeds in. It is going to happen and most likely will be a big cause of what we'll see in terms of regulation in the future. But yeah. That makes sense. It's already here. It is already here. In our next episode of Alluvium Insider, Kieran Warwick, co-founder of Alluvium, obviously, we're going to do a deep dive on Alluvium's in-game economy, going deep on land sale, Alluvatars, ILV versus us, SILV2, NFTs, merch, and esports. And you can ask him any question next week. It'll be right here on Friday, right here on Alluvium's YouTube channel. I want to thank our guests, Crypto Stash and Paul Barron, for being here today. Thank you so much for joining us. Honestly, your thoughts here exceeded my expectations. These guys are two of the most premium content creators and media uh, businesses out there, just educating everyone for free about crypto gaming and about this space. That's why I brought them on. And so if you are not already subscribed, link in the description, as well as link in the pinned comment and live chat, give them the alluvium bump and subscribe to their channels right now. Fantastic educational content in the space. I personally watch their videos every week. Guys, thank you so much for joining me today. This was a great discussion. Yeah, appreciate you, man. Great. It was great. Yeah, Gr have fun. Great seeing you, Stash. Yeah, Take same, care, everyone. Man. All right, adios, everybody. We'll see you next Friday on the next episode of Alluvium Insider. Adios.